good morning um if we could have any one person who's online pray with us um we have a lia online uh, lia could you open with a word of prayer and then we will begin our class lia okay maybe lia has not logged in uh then in that case okay <laughs> jeffina if you could please do that for us No. Okay, very sorry, but Pastor John Paul, if you could pray for us. Yes, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for bringing us together in your presence. Lord, we ask for your presence to lead us uh, as we're going to continue to learn from your word. Speak to us, Lord. Help us to understand your word. Help us to pay attention and also to uh, remember the things that you are teaching us today, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So uh, last week we focused on the teachings of Jesus, the final instructions, uh, the most probably uh, important things that he regarded, you know, would be useful for the disciples in the coming days after his resurrection. So these are the things which he imparts to them. Uh, so we looked at uh, chapters. 14, 15, 16 last week. So now we are kind of moving into the ending, the final chapters of this gospel. Uh, today we will look at uh, chapters 17 to 19, um, because this is basically where we see the intercessory prayer of Jesus and then his uh, arrest and uh, crucifixion. So uh, these would be the passages that we will be covering today. Uh, let's get started. Uh, with a few thoughts on the intercessory prayer that Jesus does for us. Because if you see this passage, uh, in this passage, he does not only pray for his disciples and the followers who were there with him at that time. He also prays for all believers, even the ones who would come in the future, who would be part of his flock. Uh, so um, let's look at the uh, prayer uh, that he prays for us. Uh, it begins with um, an interesting statement and then it moves into the other prayer points that Jesus wanted to bring uh, before the Father. Uh, so if we could have someone read out for us uh, John chapter 17 and verses 1, 2 and 3, please. Yeah, please go ahead. John 17, 1 to 3. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have yes. glorified you on... Yeah. Yeah. So... um. In uh, verse 1, Jesus begins by saying, uh, the hour has come. Up to now, you know, on many occasions uh, in the Gospel of John, we see that the hour has not yet come. And so um, on many occasions, Jesus escapes from the crowds which wish to harm him, which wish to stone him, because the hour had not come. And But here, finally, we see that the hour has indeed come. So obviously the R is referring to the time of um, crucifixion when he will finally accomplish the purpose for which he has come to this earth. Uh, so he says, now that the R has come, glorify your son. He is the prayer with which uh, Jesus begins. And then he goes on to say, why, why am I asking uh, the father to glorify me? So that the son may glorify the father in return. So this actually is not a selfish prayer of self-promotion. Rather, this is a prayer in which the son is saying, Father, glorify me because my purpose is this, to glorify you in turn. And um, this reveals to us the heart of Jesus 
you know the the heart which he always had to honor the father to obey the father to submit the, to the father as and when required so in all things uh, we see a selflessness uh, you know in all of his actions and now even in his prayer we see the same thing reflected where the focus is not on himself the focus is more on pleasing the father fulfilling the father's will now uh, when we go to the lord in prayer you know like jesus taught us he taught us to pray for our needs you know he said uh, we must ask the father and say give us today our daily bread uh, you know so we do pray for our needs uh, but uh, the attitude with which we approach him you know that is expressed in the first portion of the prayer which jesus taught us where where we are saying you know let your father come and let, let uh, you know uh, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven you know in in those wordings uh the attitude with which we need to come to the lord in prayer is reflected so we do come to him and ask for our needs but we ask in line with his will so that his will is done in our lives in our homes in the same way that it is done in heaven so even here jesus is practicing what he has taught the disciples so when he is praying he places the father first and he says yes in this hour which has finally come i need to be glorified i need to defeat sin and death but i am doing all of this so that your purposes may be glorified and um, so uh, i am not saying that we should not be free and open with the lord when we go to him in prayer he wants us to be completely frank completely open with him because this is our heavenly father that we are going to but even as we kneel down in prayer in his presence you know it's just him and us there's nobody else listening uh, we are not praying in public uh, for for to be heard this is just between us and him at that time when we are presenting our requests maybe it would be good for us to just um, take a look at our prayer how do we pray uh, what are our priorities when we pray are they all prayer points which are about our needs and um, you know uh, us wanting to uh, be maybe promoted in different areas of life us gaining things which we uh, require for our uh, everyday you know uh, life so is it all that or something in our prayers does it also reflect a love for god uh, a desire to fulfill his purposes to see him honored and glorified so i am not saying that when we pray we you know we, we should condemn ourselves and look at ourselves and you know look down on what we are praying no but just maybe just to know our heart maybe we the next time when we go to the lord in prayer just take a look at our prayer list and then ask ourselves what kind of a uh, list is this what priorities is it reflecting because um when we are praying it shows what is there in the innermost being in jesus case when he was praying what is there at the core of his being to honor the father when we are praying what is at the core of our very being what are our deepest ambitions and desires is it only for self promotion or to have you know our needs met or is also there a, a desire there to honor god to you know let his will be done in our lives to see him being glorified in our homes in our families uh, so um, just to take a few minutes to reflect on our prayer uh, would help us just to kind of get an idea of what actually lies at the core of our being what are our deepest uh, you know desires uh, so here we see that Uh, uh jesus was focused on glorifying the father uh so mm, maybe we should imitate him uh in our own prayer life may we begin by honoring the father may we uh, desire that his name should be hallowed uh may we would genuinely like to see his will being done not just in heaven but even in our homes and in our decisions and in our everyday walk and then we move into the other requests because um, you know um, once we have our priorities right 
it really doesn't matter what we are going to be asking for uh, uh, you know with regard to our needs because we will ask with the right attitude the right attitude has already been established we have decided that he should be hallowed we have decided that his will should be done so all the prayer needs that we are now going to be placing before him it's going to flow out of that attitude of reverence for our lord and savior you know so um, uh, it, it, this kind of helps us to show the uh, attitude with which we should approach the lord in prayer now the next two verses reveal something very interesting about eternal life um uh, here jesus says uh, you have granted me the authority uh, over all people uh, to you know grant eternal life to those who come to the father uh, and then in verse 3 this is what jesus says about eternal life he's giving a definition here about eternal life and this is what he says now this is eternal life that they know you and um, uh, when he says that they know you is referring to the uh, triune god that they should know god the father they should also know jesus christ so he says eternal life is this eternal life is not a ticket to heaven eternal life is not to get gain access to all the abrahamic blessings all that is part of our eternal life but eternal life as such is actually knowing god knowing jesus christ because what happens is um, you know some people they get the wrong idea about what the salvation prayer is all about they think that they are saying the salvation prayer so that they can now gain access to um, the blessings they can gain access to this free ticket to heaven they can gain access to all the privileges which come along all the perks that come along with uh, being a follower of jesus but no that's not what the salvation prayer is about the salvation prayer is basically where you're coming and saying i have now discovered you i didn't know that there was someone like you but now oh you know eternal god now i know who you are now i know what you have done for me and i want to know you so that actually is eternal life where god is not just a means to an end where you're approaching god to acquire many other good things which you're hoping to have no that is not salvation salvation is just knowing him and having a relationship with him now this in fact was a revelation for me when i first learned it because for most of my christian life i had always been kind of focused on john 10:10 10, 10, and i misunderstood john 10:10 10, 10. you know we all are very familiar with john 10:10 10, 10. that's basically the verse where it says the thief uh, the evil one comes only to steal and kill and destroy uh, and of course jesus when he was referring to the thief he was also talking about the pharisees who were false leaders false shepherds so he says you people are only want to you know uh, shepherd the flock so that you can steal and kill and destroy them uh, but i have come so he says i am the true shepherd and he says i have come that they may have life and have it to the full so for me salvation always meant that oh okay in christ i'm going to have an abundant life it never occurred to me that i was treating god as the means to an end the end being me getting the blessings me having that abundant life me having that peace and joy which i we know i can enjoy in him it never occurred to me occurred to me that i'm making god the means to an end that he himself is not the end itself it never occurred to me that i was doing that uh, for many years and it, when, it, when it first uh, you know came to my mind that my attitude was wrong about salvation about eternal life it was quite a shock uh, i realized that i was treating god in the same way the world treats santa claus because you see nobody really cares about that plump man in a red suit uh, with that funny looking white beard nobody goes to him uh, for himself nobody cares about him they go to him for the gifts that he's going to be bearing so he's just the means to an end but this god of gods is no santa he is the gift he is the prize he is what eternal life and salvation are all about and so this is such a important statement maybe we should include this when we are sharing the gospel message so that people don't come to jesus just for blessings and they just 
think that he is, Jesus is some kind of a Santa Claus, maybe we should teach them that this is eternal life, that we get to know God, that we get to know Jesus Christ whom he has sent, because then our focus is correct. And we start off our Christian walk uh, knowing that we, are be that we are beginning a relationship with him. He is not someone that we are cultivating a relationship with just to get things out of him. No, he himself is the end towards which you know we, um, uh, we are moving. And so we have entered into this relationship with him to know him. And uh, it, on a day-to-day -day basis, we will choose to sanctify ourselves because we, we value this relationship. We want to hold on to him. We do not want to lose him. So it becomes a walk of sanctification where every day we start setting ourselves apart more and more so that we can have a greater and greater intimacy with this Jesus into who, uh, with, with whom we have entered into a relationship. So it kind of helps us to get our priorities right when we understand this important uh, concept. Now, moving on to uh, some other things. Um, maybe if we could have someone read out for us, uh, John chapter 17, verses 11, um, maybe just 11 and 12. Yeah, if someone could read out for us, John 17. 11 and 12, please. Yeah, if you know all of you could have your Bibles with you when you come for the class. Um, and if you could open your Bibles to you know the passages that we are covering, um, that would make it easy for you to just quickly unmute and read the verses you know that I'm requesting. So John chapter 17, if someone could read out for us verses 11 and 12, please. Anybody online? Who can read out John uh, 17, 11, and 12? John 17, 11, and 12. When <clears throat> now I'm no longer in the world, but, they, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those who, whom you have given me and that they may be one as we are while i was with them in the world i kept them in your name those whom you gave me i have kept and none of them is lost except the son of Padi perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled Yes, thank you. Uh, so here, the first prayer request that Jesus is placing before the Father is that uh, the Father would keep these disciples who have come you know, to the Lord um, and who have accepted the Son whom he has sent. So Jesus says, the first prayer request is this, Father, protect them, keep them. How? By the power of your name is what it says in verse 11. So we are today being kept by the power of the name uh, of Jesus. Um, on our own, we would not be able to stay in this relationship with the Almighty One. You know, this, uh, this, this eternal life that we have entered into of knowing Him, having a relationship with Him. We would never be able to succeed in this relationship uh, because He is divine. Uh, he is perfect he is holy we on the other hand uh, are still you know a work in progress um, there are still so many things uh, defects that need to be overcome that need to be straightened out uh, so it would never be possible for us to have a relationship with this almighty one if it were not for this power of the name of jesus that is keeping us in him so uh, basically uh, the reason that we are all able to continue in our walk with the Lord is only because of the power of the name of Jesus. He is the one who keeps us. 
Uh, so the prayer which Jesus prayed that day, you know, before the Father, for his disciples and for all the followers who would come in the future generations, uh, that prayer is being answered even today. You and I are benefiting from that uh, intercessory prayer which Jesus prayed on that day because that day he did not pray just for the immediate followers of that time. He also included us in that prayer. And so we are all being kept by the power of the name of Jesus. And Jude one twenty four says something very lovely regarding this. So if someone could turn in their Bibles to you know uh, the end of the Bible uh, to Jude, um, which has only one chapter. So Jude one twenty four. Uh, if someone could read out verse twenty four. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Yes, uh, it's talking about Jesus here who is going to present us before the Father with exceeding joy uh, because he is able to keep us from stumbling. The power in the name of Jesus is, uh, uh, you know, will help us. It will enable us. It will equip us to stay in him and not to backslide and go away, you know, back into the world. So he will enable us and help us to keep from stumbling so that one day we will be presented before the father uh, without fault is what it says over here. So uh, this verse has been of great comfort to me in my Christian walk. Uh, because there are times when I fall, um, uh, spiritually when I fall, when I have sinned against the Lord and I feel so deeply ashamed and I say, I should have known better after all these years of you know having taught the Bible, of having known him. How could I have been so foolish and so selfish as to you know commit that sinful deed? And I'm, when I'm feeling really bad, I'm reminded of this verse and I say, no, no. You know, because Satan comes to you and says at such points of time, he says, ah, see, you will never change. You will always be like this. You will always be the one who will you know, um, disappoint the Lord. And so when those thoughts come into the mind, then the scripture helps me, you know, because I tell myself, no, I have a God and Savior who is able to keep me from stumbling. Yes, it is true that right now I have fallen, but I am repenting and I am ashamed for, of what I have done. And now the Lord will help me so that I will not go back to what to the you know the, the foolish um, wrong decision that I took. And next time, if there is a, if the same temptation comes my way, I will be able to succeed. Why? Because the power of the name of Jesus is able to keep me from stumbling. Even as I look to him and depend upon him, he will enable me to live in victory. And one day I too will be presented before the father without fault, without blemish. And that's such a, uh, you know, um, assurance for us believers to have. So what Satan tries to do is he tries to discourage us and make us think that we are one hopeless case. We, maybe all the others will succeed, but we, you know, uh, I in particular will never make it. That's what Satan uh, comes to us and says and when, we, when, you know, when we have fallen. He makes us feel guilty. He makes us feel ashamed. And he makes us feel that we will never be able to overcome certain areas you know, um, in life where we tend to always stumble. So the promise is this. The truth is this, that we have a savior who is indeed able to keep us from stumbling. So rather than listen to the lies of the evil one, rather than listen to the discouraging um, you know, uh, false uh, things that the, that Satan is, you know, telling us. We need to rely on scriptures like this, like Jude one twenty four, uh, like this uh, John seventeen verse eleven, where we are told, you know, that the Lord can keep us. In fact, in verse twelve, John seventeen verse twelve, Jesus says, "None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction." So, you know, uh, Judas made his decision right in the beginning. He was there basically for the money that he could steal. He never really wanted to be part of a, a follower of Jesus. But all the others who came to Jesus because they were so oh, you know, joyful to have discovered the Messiah, they all came for Jesus' sake, you know, for the sake of the Messiah. 
and so no, he kept them safe that's what jesus says i protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me and now i am you know going out of this world and so you o oh lord uh, you the father continue to keep them through the name which you have given me is what jesus says um, so the first request that jesus places before the father is that we should be kept safe we should be protected that one day we will be presented before the father without fault the second request which jesus places um before the father is that we should be sanctified on a daily basis uh, now that would be verses 17 to 19 uh, maybe we can read up to word verse 21 um if someone could read out for us uh, uh chapter 17 verses 17 to 21 please sanctify them by your truth your word is truth as you sent me into this world i also have sent them into the world and for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth <clears throat> i do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you father are in me and i in you that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me yeah in these verses we see certain very specific um, facts mentioned regarding sanctification first we get to know that sanctification happens through the word uh, the word corrects us the word of god uh, teaches us how we should view ourselves uh, in what way we should walk on a daily basis the choices we should make it's the word of god which instructs us regarding these truths on how life should be lived so we even as we choose to walk in those truths we start getting more and more sanctified more and more set apart we start becoming more uh, like him our walk is with him rather than with the world so we we are getting set apart we are getting more to be with him in a relationship with him rather than being you know in a relationship with the world so that's a process which happens through this word of truth which teaches us how to walk and it also enables us to walk um the second thing that we get to know about sanctification is that um the sanctification is being done so that we can go out into the world and serve the purposes of god uh, so all of us as believers want to serve the lord in some way but when we are not getting sanctified on a daily basis the service that we are offering the lord tends to be very corrupted and stained with selfish motives with sin um uh, and it's not really what the kind of fruit that the lord wants us to bear so sanctification is very important the way uh, we serve is influenced uh, by to what extent we are sanctified so a person who is who is allowing themselves to be sanctified by the word on a daily basis they will be able to offer a service that is pure something that will be a pleasing aroma in uh, to the lord you know um, even as all of us are sitting over here attending this class uh, you're at, you know uh, you're, you're attending this uh, class as students and this is a service that you're offering to the lord you know you you have chosen to sit over here in this class to learn from the word to equip yourselves so if you are sitting over here with a sanctified heart on a daily basis not just hearing the truth but also practicing it uh, also living it out in your choices then that service that you're offering to the lord as a student is a sanctified and your service in the same way me the teacher if i'm just teaching over here you know as a teaching exercise but i'm not really uh, experiencing sanctification on a daily basis however nice my teaching may sound it's unclean in the lord's eyes if there is no sanctification going on in my life 
So what I offer to the Lord will be pure only if sanctification is happening inside of me, inside of us, whether we are students or whether we are the teacher, what are we offering to the Lord? Is this a sanctified um, service that is being offered? Or is it just something that's coming out of our own uh, you know, self-centeredness, out of our sinfulness? Uh, so sanctification does matter. It, 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 um, it either leads to a pure and holy service unto the Lord, or it leads to a service that we are offering God, which is corrupted, which is not good enough. Um, so Jesus says in verse 19, the reason I sanctified myself to the extent of going to the cross, I did that so that they too may be truly sanctified. So now in Jesus, by his power, by the finished work of the cross, we too can lead sanctified lives. So Jesus says to the Father, keep them, protect them. Do not let the evil one deceive them into thinking that, oh, they will never make it, you know, uh, and also keep them from harm and danger. So he's asking for that. And second, he says, Lord, continue to sanctify them so that they can really enjoy this eternal life, to know you, draw closer to you, have a more and more intimate relationship with you. And out of that, their service will flow out and it will be a pure and uh, holy service unto you. And you know that will be like a pleasing aroma unto the Lord. So part of that sanctification, the last fact that we see regarding sanctification is unity. So um, it, 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 he, he says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And uh, okay, before that, he says that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. So we would have to overcome our different um, um, cultural backgrounds, our different perspectives and worldviews. And in spite of all our differences, we should be willing to be united. No, because sometimes uh, th that's basically why we ended up with so many denominations, right? Because one group of believers feel that they are superior to another to another group of believers, and um, that leads to division. On the other hand, in spite of us having different perspectives, in spite of us having different cultural backgrounds, we should have that unity in the spirit, which is what uh, Jesus wanted, which is what Jesus prayed for. Uh, you know, so. Um, there will always be differences because we are you know believers from all over the world uh, we are going to have um, uh, different worldviews different perspectives but in spite of those differences are we willing to come together and be united in spirit because sanctification includes even that the more we are set apart the more it is easier for us to unite with others but the more selfish we are the less we have become sanctified, we find it difficult to lay aside those things, you know, um, our uh, our own perspectives and choose to uh, love others, even though they hold a different perspective. So uh, all of these things matter, and uh, so Jesus asked the Lord that we he uh, that we would be sanctified in this manner. Um, just another one point, uh, you know, um, even as he praise for those who will come in the future ages because in verse 22 the lord says i have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are um and then um he goes on to talk about okay yeah verse 21 onwards he starts praying for all the believers who will come even in the future and then in um yeah in verse 22 this is what he says. he says. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Um, so the Lord has imparted his glory to us in the sense all of us are going to be confirmed into the image of the sun. Nobody is going to be more in the image of the sun than somebody else when we all get to heaven. We all are equally going to be confirmed to the image of the sun. So it's not like any one person is going to be less glorified, less in the image of the sun. And some people are going to be more glorified, more in the image of the sun. Rewards will differ because that will depend on uh, the, you know, the 
uh, the sacrifices we made for the Lord on the earth, the uh, sincere hard work that we put in, the priorities that we had, the motives that we had even as we served him, the reward will depend on that. So rewards will differ. But when it comes to our status, who we are, all of us would be equally glorified in the sense, all of us are equally in the image of the sun. Glory doesn't depend on reward. I mean, reward is a separate thing. Glorification is a separate thing. Glorification is us being made into the image of the sun. Sinful human beings who are worth nothing are now going to literally be made into the image of the sun to be like him. I mean, that's like a that's that's the ultimate glorification that a person could receive. So rewards is a separate matter. Uh, that's a different thing. Um, that is not glorification. Glorification is, is us being made into the image of the sun. And this is the assurance that we are given that all of us will be are being given the same glory. And so we don't have to be jealous of one another. We all are equally valuable. All of us have been equally chosen and appointed to go forth and bear fruit, fruit that will have eternal results. So we don't need to be jealous of one another. We all have equally received his glory. So therefore, we should be one. Even as the father and son are one, we too should be united in the same sense. Um, uh, so uh, here we, we see that there is really no need for any jealousy or competitiveness because we have all been given the same privilege. Equal privilege has been given to all of us. Um, so yes, those are just some of the main thoughts that you know uh, we could draw from the intercessory prayer of Jesus. Uh, let's move quickly into John chapter 18. Okay, so in uh, John chapter 18, uh, the focus is mainly on the arrest of Jesus. Uh, you know how, and he's tried in front of some of the uh, Jewish leaders. So uh, the these details are given in John chapter 18, and then John chapter 19 will be dealing with his uh, death and crucifixion. So John chapter 18, um, let's look at the arrest which takes place. Uh, so um, if we could have someone read out for us the first six verses, we'll look at a few details. Um, so we have moved into John chapter 18. If someone can read out for us the first six verses, please. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went up with his disciples over the blue to John where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often went there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with the animals of the weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Go by your seat. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas who betrayed him also stood with him. And now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the top. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, here in this passage, we see that the people who have come to arrest Jesus are carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. So we realize that this is taking place in the night time, uh, which means that these people are that these people who have come here to make the arrest are believe that they are doing something crooked. They are not willing to do this in the you know uh, boldly in the light of day. They feel that they need to cover this thing which they are doing as because they realize that what they are doing is not right, not just, not correct. And uh, so the very time of um, uh, night, which we know which they choose to do this deed, shows that they are aware that what they are doing is wrong. They are not doing this in their innocence. No, they very well know that what they are doing is crooked. And they know that if the public could see what they are doing, the public would not approve of it. And so they are uh, now doing it you know, in, a, in a concealed manner. So which is basically why Judas is being paid. Because Judas will know the movements of um, Judas will know yeah, the movements of Jesus. Um, 
they probably would have told him, let us know when he's going to be in some place away from the crowd all by himself and not with many people around him to defend him because at that time it will be easy for us to capture him. So they, they probably would have asked him to you know let them know. So now Judas comes to the garden. Uh, because he knows that right now Jesus is just going to be there with the disciples. No one else is going to be around. Public is not going to be watching. And so Judas the betrayer comes over there with a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests. So um, we realize uh, from this that these soldiers belong to the chief priests and the Pharisees. So this is basically referring to the temple guard. You know, the temple always had a, um, a, 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 a set of um, a team of troops you know, which, which would take turns in guarding the temple um, because the temple was inlaid with gold. Uh, so right from Solomon's time, there was always a temple guard. Uh, the temple had to be guarded. So the different gates leading into the temple uh, area would always have soldiers posted over there. Uh, so right from that time, you had a detachment of soldiers who would be um, looking after the temple, taking turns. So some of those soldiers are being used over here to make this particular arrest. And they have come along with weapons because not only have they brought torches and lanterns, but it says over there in verse 3 that they have also brought weapons. And um, when they come over there, they are coming with Judas. So they obviously know that they have come to the right place. They have come to Jesus. So Jesus rather mockingly, he says, who is it you want? He knows very well why they have come, what they have come for. He also knows why Judas has brought them. Uh, so it's more uh, of a kind of a mocking statement where he says, who is it you want? And they say Jesus of Nazareth. And then, he, you know, um, in our English translation, they add the word he, but he literally just says, I am. And then we see what happens over here, because John records that very specifically when Jesus claims who he is and declares that he is the I am, they draw back and fall to the ground. I mean, they literally fall down on the ground because he's expressing his divinity and they can't stand in front of who he is. So this actually, you know, very clearly emphasizes the fact that it was not a helpless Jesus who got trapped in a corner and then got taken away. No, this is the I am standing there in all of his authority and power and volunteering to be arrested. This is not a helpless Jesus who, you know, who got caught up in a, in, a, in a conspiracy. So it is so important to recognize this. The people who have come with their weapons to arrest him and the chief priests and the Pharisees who have come to supervise the whole thing, they all fall down to the ground. They can't stand in front of the divine I am. And then they get up, wipe themselves. And then they go ahead and make the arrest because the I am is allowing himself to be arrested. So we see the almighty God in all of his power, in all of his majesty, choosing to humble himself and do this for sinful mankind. I mean, amazing. Such ultimate divine power uh, combined with such deep compassion and such amazing humility. I mean, that is the kind of God that we are trying to imitate. So sanctification is something that we will never be able to do on our own. We go to him and say, Lord, it's only going to take place if you will enable me. Because this is the kind of God that we are trying to you know, become like. So we are trying to become more and more set apart so that we are more like him rather than like the world. Uh, so um, here um, he declares who he is, that he is the I am, and they cannot even withstand it. They fall to the ground, and then they get up and make their arrest. So we see this fact. Um, so um, then in verse 8, yeah, maybe we can have, we can read out verses 8 to 11. Yeah, we still have five minutes. So yeah, if someone could read out for us verses 8 to 11, please. Therefore, did you see only in the first door of every day? For the same mighty footprint which he is born, those who will be healed at the last one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck it to the height of the servant and cut off his height to the servant's name was Atlas. 
So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheep. And we won't drink the cup which we have under us. Yeah, thank you. So um, what had Peter said earlier? Lord, I'm willing to lay down my life for you. And the man is actually willing to, you know, show in action that he meant it. So he's now getting ready to lay down his life because he's no trained warrior. But still, he has a sword with him. You know, they probably, you know, use this because uh, they travel from place to place out in the wilderness. And, um, you know, um, at that time, they don't have anything. I mean, they, they, have, they need to protect themselves against robbers, against gangsters. So um, in those days, people always had a short dagger or a sword or something, you know, when they're traveling. Uh, so, so Peter had a sword because the, uh, you know, Peter and the disciples and Jesus would travel from village to village on foot. And so out in the wilderness, if there is any danger, they should be able to protect themselves. So that's the reason why this uh, Peter has a sword with him right now. So he draws his sword and he cuts off the high priest's uh, servant's right ear. So this is him, you know, uh, acting on the promise he made, getting ready to lay down his life for his master. But Jesus has come into the world with a very different purpose. And um, so earlier in the prayer, he had said, I have not lost even one of the ones whom you have given me, except, of course, the, you know, the son of perdition who had already made his choice. Uh, so now uh, that same thing is repeated over here in verse 9, where it, uh, uh, it says, um, so in verse 8, Jesus says, let these men go. You know, you have come to arrest me. Go ahead, arrest me. But allow these others to go. And John records and says, Jesus said these words so that what he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. So Jesus does not want any of them to be accidentally wounded or killed in the altercation which will follow, you know, if they, you know, if they resort to violence. And uh, so Jesus commands Peter and says, put your sword away. This cup which the Father is giving me, I will drink of it. Now, this would not have made sense to Peter. Jesus has been telling them over the last few weeks that, yes, he is going to be, um, you know, uh, leaving. So um, Jesus has been telling them about this, but they have not quite caught what Jesus is saying. And so now Peter and the other disciples must have been very puzzled. They were willing to go into fight mode, to fight for their master, to somehow, you know, um, uh, protect him, help him. But the master is saying, I want to drink from this cup. So no, no violence. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go with her. So, and they don't understand this. And so at this point, in their shock, in their bewilderment, they all run away. Except, of course, we see two disciples who are not able to run away. So they kind of stealthily follow at a distance behind him to see what's going to happen next, where they're going to take him. Um, so we see over here, that Jesus um, um, is so protective towards his disciples. And he says, let these men go. You have come for me. You arrest me. But uh, do not harm them in any way. All right. So uh, let's hold on to that thought. And then we'll go for our break. Um, so when we come back, we'll uh, continue from verse 12 onwards. Thank you. <laughs> 